I don't know for those who listen to Coast to Coast for a long time. I think about four years ago, I mentioned talking to a parent who wanted to get some Carolina stuff quickly because his son needed it. And uh, we called Johnny T and they were like, hey, we can rush this out and, and try to get to him. But it was it was for Kayla's family. So that, you know, bring it all See? around. They ordered from Johnny T before he uh, came to Chapel Hill because they needed a Carolina uh, sweatshirt. To, and, and see, like we make all everybody thinks we're joking about this. And everybody, you know, if you ever question the amount of information that Sherelle McMillan has at his fingertips, use that as a perfect example and allow this story of Johnny T-shirt coming full circle to to complete the the arc as as we bid adieu to Kayla Love and and I'm sure Tar Heel fans, you know, have feelings about him. But like you said at the end of the the last pod, Sherelle, that dude will always be remembered for hitting that shot over Mark Williams and uh, pushing UNC to a national championship. So, guys, I want to start this episode as we've got, um, you know, we've got uh, Paxson Wojcik committing to the Tar Heels. And I think the easy thing to think about for fans is say, all right, well, is Paxson Wojcik replacing Caleb Love? And we're going to get into that a little bit. But <laughs> with me, as always, Sean Moran, Cheryl McMillan. Boys, we just talked We just talked 24 hours ago, but now we got to talk about Paxson Wojcik. So, Coast to Coast Podcast going right now. Shout out to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring. Sean, you and I talked just last night about Paxson Wojcik and what he brought to the table. And I want to refresh everybody on his vitals so that uh, so that if they missed last episode, they know we're talking about uh, six five kids from. He claims Charleston, South Carolina, as his home, but being that as you referenced previously, his dad spent some time coaching with Matt Doherty in Chapel Hill. Uh, Paxson Wojcik is very familiar with campus and very familiar with the program. Uh, Wojcik averaged fourteen point nine points, seven point two rebounds. And just over three assists per game for the Bears at Brown this past year. Uh, dude shot 38% from three, which, as as you and Sherelle have hammered home, that is a huge Achilles heel for the Tar Heels this past season. Uh, kid was a second team All Ivy League selection, and not only he played his two years at Brown, he also played two seasons at uh, Loyola Chicago. So, Sean, let's go to immediately. How big uh, of an addition is a kid like Paxson Wojcik? to the Tar Heel roster knowing why, why are you laughing? What is it? What's you, you, you're, you're killing me here. What, what is, what does a guy like Pax and Wojcik do uh, for a Tar Heel roster? That is now not only just dearth of shooters is dearth of bodies. So uh, give me your, give me your lowdown on that, man. I think it's a great, great question. I mean, t- to be honest, I was probably a little surprised when he entered the portal and, and UNC reached out. And I know we're probably going to mention this on, Anytime we're talking about a recruit that's not from a power five school, but how, you know, what are you surrounding him with? I would imagine the goal for Paxson coming from Brown to UNC uh, is to, you know, is to, he's not coming to not get off the, off the bench, but I think coming off the bench is, is where he's going to play. Um, and it's going to, it's going to really be determined, you know, I think for, for me, he's, he's really a three. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think last year at Brown, he played the three, four, his size, you know, he wants the ball in his, his hand. I think it gives you a reliable bench player. I think there's going to be definite question marks about athleticism and how does that translate, uh, to UNC and some of the competition, but to go back to what we talked about in the podcast, I think probably one of the main benefits is going to be from the intangible perspective or, off the court. Uh, everything you read about him is that he's a, a leader. Uh, when we saw him at Chapel Hill, definitely had some some fiery spirit to him. Uh, you know, I think if coming from what his dad was, uh, mm-hmm. you know, he's not going to take any BS and, you know, he's going to be a no nonsense type of guy. And I think that's probably that that could be exactly what UNC is looking for it doesn't always have to be the best player that's the leader uh and once again the, you know that that's probably the what I'm hoping for the most is here's a guy his dad you know went to the Naval Academy grew up in that that type type of dynamic um and now you know m- maybe he's the one that can bring that leadership or that uh you know kind of kicking the kicking the butt that the team needs uh we can talk a little bit more about skill set but I'd say that's how I see him fitting in and coming off the bench um, being a reliable role player uh, or yeah. somebody that can that can give you anywhere from five to fifteen 
minutes a game, if not more, if he catches catches fire. Let's dig in a little further. So, you know, folks see him. He's probably not going to start, I would imagine. If he does, he will definitely have earned it. But he's not going to start. But help folks understand how having a player who has played Division One ball is a second-team all-conference player that shoots as well as he does. Help people understand how that one not only developed the bench on the team, but how it might help the team just learning how to play defense. Because one of the knocks on Carolina for the longest time is is the inability to mark shooters, right? So you're running against a guy like that in practice all the time. It's got to make you better, does it not? Yeah, and and before I, I get there, I, yesterday we were talking uh, Sherelle's favorite topic, uh, pickup games over the summer. And we went through the alumni that UNC was bringing back in the first game. It was all guys that are playing overseas. And mm-hmm. I think if you put yourself, if you're an overseas coach or GM, sure, you want the – the UNCs and, and, and the big names, but you almost go right to the Ivy Leagues uh, in terms of, of guys that are reliable, guys that know how to play a team game, and guys you can count on off the court. And you often see Ivy League players um, doing much better in the long run than, than a lot of uh, more talented players. So I think that is also true for, for this situation where last season in the Ivy League, um, I almost had to do a double take because he was number four in scoring in conference play. Uh, he was number four, or sorry, number five in scoring, number four in rebounding, number four in assists, and number two in assist to turnover ratio. So offensively, he knows how to play. And I think from a UNC perspective, you can count on somebody that's now five years in. Um, he knows how to play, knows what to do. He's a tough, tough guy. And you're, once again, I think, the main hope is reliability, um, reliability and leadership from Paxson. I'll go ahead and say it so everybody else can get out of the way. Coach's son, Jim Rat, <laughs> nose for the ball, uh, you know, uh, a real real floor burn type of kid. All right, Cheryl, I want you to come in and tell us a little bit about how this developed. Because as of last night, you know, after he'd had a visit to, to campus, um, we didn't really know much about how this was going to transpire other than that North Carolina had talked to him and that he was he was taking a visit to town. So – um also shout out to Sherelle for going back to back on on two shorts two two shows here so uh big ups to my man for sticking around for a coast to coast but Sherelle how did this whole thing develop man all right Joey before we do that I grew up in the Pentecostal church and we mm-hmm. are we, what we do is we repeat things so the minister says repeat after me so I want you to repeat after me neighbor Pax- no wait I'm sorry my bad <laughs> yeah Paxton Wojcik is not a Caleb Love replacement Again. just because he committed the day that Caleb Love left say it with us folks in the chat Paxson okay. Wojcik is not a Caleb Love replacement. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Um, so, you know, North Carolina likes to operate uh, kind of in a clandestine manner. Uh, they do stuff behind the scenes. They don't talk to a lot of people. Um, they just, that's just how they operated uh, all the way back to Roy Williams, basically. In, silent, in silence, like lasagna. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and so we were able to find out that he was uh, taking a visit. We didn't know when and it happened to be on sunday um so i think the alarm bell started to go off a little bit like man they there hasn't been much uh in his recruitment you know he does have a a history of chapel hill you know in chapel hill of of knowing unc and all that good stuff um they're going to need frankly bodies you know on the team they've got six five or six available scholarships at the moment um and then uh the other thing was um when you you know, take a visit that quickly and there's been no other reported visits. It just, all of the stuff started to click and was like, hmm, this, this could happen. Um, I didn't expect it to happen today. Didn't expect it to happen tonight. Um, but, you know, UNC obviously had been talking to him for a little bit. And once they got him on campus, it seems like they, they sealed the deal fairly quickly. Um, and the other thing I should add is that this doesn't impact uh, Nick Timberlake, who uh, before we had said is coming on a visit this week, but we believe he's scheduled to be on campus tomorrow. Um, so this doesn't impact him. They see him as kind of a, a, a different um, player. They're, they're similar, but different enough where they can both be on the team. And again, um, Nick Timberlake is not a Caleb Love replacement where he to, to commit to UNC. This Nick is, Timberlake is not a Caleb Love <laughs> replacement. Gotcha. This, this is simply North Carolina addressing I'm going to say this for the ninth time. I'm sure we'll say it again Sunday when we do this for the 10th time. North Carolina is addressing a historically bad 
you know, shooting season with guys who can shoot. In addition to that, if you look at their profile and, and watch them both play, they got a little edge to them. They have a little edge. And I think at times that was missing from UNC this season. So uh, in talking to folks, you know, close to his recruitment and kind of who knew what was going on, they said North Carolina liked his toughness um, mm-hmm. and they liked that he knew how to win. Um, and they liked that he knew how to play. Know how to play, Sean, is what uh, we kept hearing over and over again. He knows how to play. He knows how to play. Uh, so you can do worse than a second team, you know, all Ivy guy who is in his fifth year as, um, you know, a piece on your team. Okay. Stay there because I'm seeing folks in the chat and shout out to everybody who's here. I think there's over a thousand folks listening to us tonight. So, hey, big ups to all you guys who join us tonight. We love that you guys are here and love that you're a part of the fan. The, the Tr- chat about uh, Sherelle being in church for six hours on Sunday. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, so Thanks. what what I, what I want to... What I want to get here, um, some folks are saying Carolina is desperate, and that's absolutely not what is happening right now. I mean, maybe they're desperate for bodies, um, you know, because they have a lot of spots to fill. But Cheryl, can you please speak to that? That just because this is the first guy Carolina takes, you know, again, help folks understand this is a very fluid process. You do this much better than I do. So, so explain to everybody that just because they're taking a guy that's a second team, you know, Ivy League player, and he's not a you know first round. NBA pick at this point, you know, see if you can get folks to pump the brakes on making an assessment of of UNC's work in the transfer portal. Okay. First, Paxson Wojcik is not a Caleb Love replacement. <laughs> um, it's my man. I love you for that, dude. No, you know, it's, it again, it is a, it's simultaneously a sprint and a marathon because you do need to start you know, filling out your roster and, and getting players who you know will be on campus so you can work through logistics and make sure they're here for first summer session so you can start integrating them into everything that UNC wants to do. At the same time, there are going to be more talented players who come into the portal. Like, I, I guarantee it. I, I, I know it. <laughs> like, it's just, it's it's going to happen. And it's going to happen. Look at Sherelle's phone. <laughs> it's going to happen. And it's going to happen. You know, there will be some in the next week. There will probably be some in three weeks. There will probably be some in a month. And, you know, they don't have to, players don't have to withdraw from the NBA draft. So the, let me start over. What a lot of players are doing, or, or players who have pro interests, what Pete Nance did last year is you uh, announce for the NBA draft, you enter the portal at the same time. You go through the pre-draft process and you determine whether or not you're going to go to the NBA. For guys who are doing that, most of the time, they're not going to be able to be drafted. They just want to get that feedback. Then they have until May 31st to withdraw from the draft and they're still still can be in the portal because they're already in there. So they don't have to make a decision just because the portal closes. As long as you're in the portal before it closes, which I believe is May 13th, um, you can still, you know, figure out what you want to do. So, you know, you have to be careful. You want to take guys who you can who you think can help, but you also want to make sure that you're allowing yourself to be open and have the scholarships available for, you know, additional talent that might come through. So it's a balancing act. And I don't think taking Paxson Wojcik, who is not a Caleb Love replacement, is going to um, impact what North Carolina does down the road because they have a, a bunch of scholarships open. Like I said, five or six scholarships uh, open, and you, you you don't have to be super, super selective um, when you have five or six scholarships open. And, and again, they're all at the wing, right? Like, so you've got to have bodies. And I, I, to to quote Sherelle, what he said earlier, I want to make sure everybody hears this. He made the comment earlier that UNC could do a lot worse than a second team all Ivy League player who has played four years of college basketball and scored as well as he did last year and shot 38% from three. UNC could do a lot worse than that. And, Sean, and Joy, Joy, let me add something too. We, we talked about yeah. it the whole time is that you have to judge, you can't judge one individual move and say, okay, Carolina. What are they doing in the transfer portal? There's no yeah. one good in there. They're taking, you know, Paxson and Wojcik, you know, and, and I've, I've seen that kind of just anecdotally, on, yeah. again, on social media, which is not a representation of everybody. Um, but you have to look at the plan first. And the plan is to get more athletic and improve their shooting, get more athletic, improve shooting, and overall just be better. So the question is, do you think having someone like Paxson and Wojcik will help North Carolina be a better team next season? Um, you can say yes or no, but I think you have to respect the plan and say, well, okay, I can see how that makes sense, why they would think that he does. Um, and then we can judge the merits, you know, of, of how they um, uh, executed on the plan later. So I think let's let's judge the plan, which is, are they, 
yeah, getting better, um, you know, from a shooting perspective, are they getting more athletic and are they getting better as a team? So when the day comes in June or July, when the roster is, is solid, we can say, did they execute on their stated plan? Yeah. I, I, for again, I appreciate you resetting that. And for those who are listening and aren't watching us live, I do think we're making some, some progress in getting folks to understand that Pax and Wojcik nor Nick Timberlake are Caleb Love replacements. Uh, Sean, I want to come back to you, man. Um, help, I guess, give some context a little bit. We talked earlier about how a player like Wojcik, uh, while he may not be preseason first team all ACC, but help people understand how having a player like that who is a veteran, who is savvy, but who can just shoot from anywhere, just about anywhere in the gym, what does that do as far as developing depth? And what does that do as hopefully uh, folks being able to see Hubert Davis stretch the bench next year? Right. We talked about you know how how he didn't get a chance to let the younger guys play this year. So not only do you get a, a depth piece to help challenge the starters and challenge the rest of the squad, but maybe if you get a guy that's a veteran, they can be trusted more than maybe the guys that Hubert Davis had at his disposal this past year. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think that's the hope in terms of of trust. It was obvious that the trust did not exist this year uh, with with some of, with a lot of the bench players in terms of how they were utilized uh, with what they're potentially bringing in next year, bench is going to be very important. So it'll be interesting to see, does Coach Davis rely on what he's been doing the past two years? And once the second half begins, he's not making a substitution uh, unless he is forced to. And I think that could definitely have negative ramifications next year in the portal. Um, when, when you see the guys that they recruited this year uh, that then didn't, didn't play, but Hypothetically, uh, they utilize a bench. Uh, a guy like Paxson is, is coming off the bench. And once again, coach's son, great assist to turnover ratio, you know, very efficient, knows how to play. Um, you know, he can come in, left handed guy. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the 38% shooting, and it's on a high, high volume, around 150 shots this year. But last year, you know, it was only around 30, 33%. So I think that, that will still be a question. I think he can shoot. Uh, but he's not going to be getting seven, seven threes a game. So once again, when you're down to one or two, I think mentally that's a lot, a lot different, which we saw with some of the guys this year. But I mean, all you have to do is go back to his junior year, uh, one of his first few games when he was at the Dean Dome, and he didn't shoot. The, he was zero for five from three, but he attacked the basket, left-handed. Mm-hmm. He's he's gonna he's gonna use his shoulder and go go right into you. Um, and I think that's something that we've seen Carolina guys maybe shy away away from contact uh now the acc might be a little different where you're going right into somebody and the shot's getting blocked but he, he's going going to attack and i think offensively and defensively he's going to know the plays uh he, he's not going to be out of position he's probably going to be telling other guys where to go and i think those are just some of the, the key things that keyword davis and the unc staff didn't have full confidence on doing the right thing at the right time and i think you're going to get that from him uh and then it's just probably going to be on a game by game situation on matchups. Um, how did he do in the first half? But it is hopeful that it's not going to be just five to six guys, uh, you know, rolling 38, 38 minutes a game again. Sean, I want to come back to you to talk about schematics in a second uh, and spreading the floor with a player like that. Sherelle, can you help give some, some context to what having veteran players who have played in different places in college basketball, but have played four years uh, what that might do for a player like Simeon Wiltshire coming in next year for, for North Carolina. I think you've seen it a- across the country um, in that we talked about it last night, that veterans and experienced guys typically win. And I think they have that um, a no-nonsense attitude just because they've been through it. They've, they've struggled maybe as freshmen and uh, maybe didn't do all the winning that they wanted to do, uh, ha- maybe had to try elsewhere to, to play. And those combined struggles helped them get to the point where they were. So if you're Paxton Wojcik, who is not a cable love replacement, and you're working with Simeon Wiltshire next year, um, I think, you know, Wiltshire is a hard worker. And I think there'll be kind of a mutual respect. You'll see, man, this guy from the Ivy League, you know, he worked hard because he, he started off at Loyola Chicago and, and went to Brown. And now he's in Chapel Hill. And, uh, you know, he, he found his way into a scholarship here. And I think that mutual respect of, 
of uh, work ethic, um, of wanting to be great, of uh, knowing how to win, which again is what we heard a lot when it yeah. comes to Wojcik. I think that rubs off. And um, I don't want to use a cliche that a lot of people use uh, about a certain metal that makes people better. But I do think it, it rings true in this particular situation and that being around people who work hard and being around people who want to compete makes you want to work hard and compete. Uh, so even if, if Paxton Wojcik you know, is this, if he starts or if he's the seventh man or the eighth man, I think his uh, willingness to compete, um, his experience, and uh, to some degree leadership will definitely rub off on all the UNC players and be a, a net positive. Uh, Sean, I think one of the things that we saw this team struggled with this year was uh, the ball was getting stuck. Uh, Brady Mannix, one of his undervalued traits was that the ball never got stuck in his hands. Uh, he always knew how to reverse it, how to keep things moving laterally on the court and to keep the defense on their toes. When you have a player, regardless of whether it's uh, Pax and Wojcik or, you know, potentially other players that may be considering North Carolina that are are shooters, how does that help Hubert Davis's offense do what it is that he's hoping it will do? Yeah, I don't think he's going to be making as quick decisions as, as Brady did in terms of, of moving the ball, but I think one of the things when you when you watch some of his his games, he's a really good really good rebounder. Uh, even given his size, around seven seven rebounds a game, mostly defensive, but he can grab and go. And I think the most frustrating thing, at least for me, watching UNC this year, was just how horrible they were in transition and just the, the lack of ability to to move the ball up the court by passing. Uh, and that's something he can do in terms of grab and go. That was something um, Timberlake could do. I'd say Wojcik was probably better at that than Timberlake, but that's just hopefully another addition where you don't have to rely on RJ Davis coming back to the ball. Mm. I think we'd all love to see them play a little bit, uh, you know, more up, up tempo, but um, you know, I think once again, he's a, he's a smart player. It might not move as, as fast because sometimes he does like to, to get the ball and, and uh, you know, look to look to attack, which can take a few seconds to, to set up. But when he does attack, it's not like he has blinders on and the ball's only going to the rim. Uh, if you're if you're cutting or you're you're open, uh, he'll be able to find you. And I think once again that that was something just with how few assists the team did have. Obviously, that's a product of not hitting shots at times. But if you're if you're moving the ball um, if, and if you're finding the right guy in the right position, that can help. So I think he's a he's a, a an upgrade in terms of an IQ perspective, basketball wise. And I think mm -hmm. Carolina uh, definitely needs that. But the same time, you're going to need some elite athletes as well. And I think that's what we're still hoping to find uh, that can be paired with RJ and Armando. Uh, Sherelle, last question. We need to wrap this thing up and get out of here for the night. Uh, you're listening to the Coast to Coast podcast. Instant commitment. We're doing a live version, but also this will be dropped into your pod feeds talking about Pax and Wojcik committing to North Carolina from Brown. He has one year left to play for the Tar Heels. Sherelle, I want to ask, is Paxson Wojcik a Caleb Love replacement? No, I'm kidding. Um, I've seen some folks in the chat already mention that Paxson Wojcik is going to be a Justin Pierce redux. I'm throwing that up to you as a softball, and I want you to debunk that as best as you're able, not only just because of their size discrepancy and the difference in their games, but can you please just speak to that a little bit? Well, I mean, I, I can't really debunk it because I don't know. And anyone claiming that they know – what is going to happen in November, like holler at me. So well, I can... well, people are bunking it in the chat. So <laughs> yeah. I was hoping you could debunk it, but I, I got you. Uh, yeah. I, I, I would just say, um, I think the roles will be different. I think, uh, you know, at the time when UNC uh, took Justin Pierce, you know, there wasn't a transfer portal. It was just graduate transfers. And among the graduate transfers, you know, he was one of the top five available pretty much by everybody. So and UNC again, had spots and UNC had spots. So again, judge the plan. The plan is, was that they needed, you know, kind of a guy who could play some some three and some four and potentially make shots. And it didn't work out that way, but the plan, you know, was solid. Things sometimes just don't work out. I know that's hard to accept, but sometimes you just don't. Um, and I think with Wojcik, he's being recruited, it, from what I understand, um, you know, kind of in a, in a different way. Um, again, North Carolina has the spots. Um, and this is his, his, his last stop, you know, playing college basketball. And more than anything, um, the kid gets a little bit of a dream. You know, we haven't been able to talk to him, but the quotes that he did give were that, you know, this is a dream school and this is a dream come true. So, uh, you know, that above anything else, I think it will show you uh, that he'll come in and, and work hard and try to set a good example 
And for a team who people say, you know, has maybe been missing some of that culture, some of that edge uh, post Final Four appearance, I think it's a, a welcome sight. And again, um, you know, he, we don't know exactly what his role is going to be, but I can tell you one more time that he is not a Caleb Love replacement. Um, and so just don't treat it <laughs> such. Don't like, because no, I mean, seriously, because what happened last year? No, somebody, somebody's going to hit you up on yeah, the board what, or what, on social what, media tomorrow and say, hey, what, what is this dude replacing Caleb Love? No, I got what, you. What happened last year was Brady Manick, you know, uses his eligibility. And then mm-hmm. Matthew Meyer, and they're like, oh, there it is, Brady Manick 2.0. And he didn't come to Carolina. And then it was, oh, Pete Nance, Brady Manick 2.0. The first thing Hubert Davis said when, uh, when Pete Nance signed was, Pete Nance is going to do some good things for us, but he's not Brady. You know, everybody who covers Carolina, he's not Brady. He's not Brady. He's not Brady. And then when he's not Brady, people are like, why is he not Brady? Well, we, you know, we've been telling you for a year that he wasn't Brady. So I want to go ahead and get ahead of this. Like, Passing Wojcik isn't coming in to, to, you know, take, you know, 600 shots or whatever. He's not going to come in and be the guy. That's not, you know, going to be his role. Um, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have a role. And Carolina fans can't be so haughty to think that someone from the Ivy League can't come and help you and see when we watched, you know, the last three weeks, every single team has somebody from a lower level who came up and has played really well in the tournament. So don't don't dismiss it outright just because it doesn't look like you think it is. Don't don't judge a book by its cover. It's like a basic rule we learned when we were like three or four years old. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's it. I'm done. Yeah, but it's just so much more fun to have these like instant knee jerk reactions and freak out about stuff. Right. That's 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 why that's why we do what we do. That's why we love that's why we love the social medias and the sports. Anyway, um, hey, shout out to everybody who made uh, made this appointment, television or viewing tonight, however you want to call it. A uh, ton of folks in the chat. Um, going to wrap this show. There will certainly be more news coming in the very near future. At minimum, there will be another Coast to Coast podcast dropping for everybody next Sunday night. And hey, if you're in the chat here and you have not subscribed to the Coast to Coast, the hell's wrong with you? Get your life together. Seriously, um, go ahead and subscribe to all Aussies podcasts. Come be a part of it. We appreciate you guys uh, dialing in tonight. Shout out to everybody who's listening right now. I hope that you enjoyed it. Give us a five-star review if you've done so. But this has been the Coast to Coast podcast. We love you, Johnny T-Shirt, for sponsoring. Thank you to Tommy Ashley for producing this show tonight. Sherelle, man, you played all 40 minutes. And now's your time to go get in the ice bath. Take care of those joints. Uh, Go see Jonas. Get yourself taken care of. Get some sleep. Sean, appreciate you, buddy. We'll talk to you very, very soon. Uh, And hope that you guys have a good rest of your week. We'll talk to you soon on the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. Late.